Hi, welcome to iEducator. This is Teacher Jeff. I'm an educator and an engineer by profession. And today, we will discuss chapter one. And chapter one is all about the introduction to ergonomics. And today, I will be highlighting four key areas as our topic outline. First is the focus of ergonomics. Second is the disciplines associated with ergonomics. Third is the brief history of ergonomics. And lastly, the ergonomics domains of specialization. Whether you're an ergonomics professional or you're new to the field, it's actually helpful every once in a while to take a broad view of what ergonomics is and how its fundamental principles can be applied. At the very least, you'll be able to explain what ergonomics is in a social setting. At the very best, you'll start to see how deeply the field of ergonomics impacts your world at work, at home, and the places in between. Today we will discuss or tackle the focus of ergonomics first. Now what is meant by ergonomics? Ergonomics, according to International Ergonomics Association, it is defined as the scientific discipline concerned with the understanding of interactions among humans and other elements of a system and the profession that applies theory, principles, data, and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. If we see a scientific discipline, it means that ergonomics is a branch of scientific knowledge. And if we see concerned with the understanding of interactions among humans and other elements of a system, it means that it is concerned with how humans interact with the tools and equipment they use while performing tasks and other activities. Now, ergonomics comes from the Greek words ergon, which means work, and nomos, which means loss. So literally speaking, ergonomics means the loss of work or the science of work. Now, the workplace is not the only place to think about when considering ergonomics. Many hobbies and everyday activities performed outside of the workplace can be sources of ergonomic stressors. One example would be home computing or gaming. Now, many people these days use their computer or gaming console at home to unwind, but these pursuits at home can provide just as much opportunity for static and awkward postures as you can see on the first picture. If you are a console gamer, remember to take breaks and shift position regularly, as you can see on the second picture, from sitting to standing position. Or if not, you can just sit directly in front of the screen, preferably at a distance where you can view the entire screen at one time with your neck in a neutral position. The head should not be tilted backward, forward, or twisted to the side, just like what you can see in the first picture, which is the wrong way. This is exactly the wrong way because you can get musculoskeletal disorder or MSD. Another example that would be handheld devices. Now, many people are spending more and more time with their tablets and smartphones, but these are not or these are not free of ergonomic stressor. As you can see in the first photo, the man is flexing his neck and head to look at his device in the lap, which is obviously wrong because it requires isometric contraction of neck extensor muscles to hold the head in an imbalanced posture. If we continue to do this, then most likely we will experience a strain on the neck. And therefore, the right posture or position should be on the second image. We should bring the device up 
to the eye level because doing it would relieve the stress on our neck. Now, another example that would be gardening. Now, gardening can be hard on the body due to the propensity for prolonged awkward postures. And in general, good ergonomics basics should be remembered while gardening. We need to keep work close to you, take frequent rest breaks, maintain mutual postures whenever possible, and use the proper tools just like as shown on the slide presentation. And another topic we have, workplace ergonomics. Remember, workplace design is the science of designing the workplace, keeping in mind the capabilities and limitations of the workers. Now, when we design the workplace, it should be the best design possible because if not, then poor worksite design leads to fatigued, frustrated, and hurting employees. And because of this, we should not expect our workers to be productive. And more likely, it leads to a painful and costly injury lower productivity and poor product quality. Now the first example that we have that is evident in workplace ergonomics, that would be material handling. As you can see on our first example, it is an example of material handling or simply how materials are being moved, stored, protected, and controlled throughout the manufacturing, warehousing, distribution, consumption, and disposal. As you can see in the sample pictures, material handling in this case incorporated manual process, which is quite hazardous, not only to the product, but also to the workers themselves. Workers may experience musculoskeletal disorders or MSDs for lifting heavy materials. And because we have MSDs, this will make them easily get stressed and fatigued. And because of stress and employee fatigue, this will eventually result to employee absenteeism. And because of absenteeism, they will most likely get demotivated returning back to work. And so for this matter, this will increase our employee turnover, okay? And the second example that is evident in the workplace ergonomics, that would be work height positioning. As you can notice in the first picture, the working is, or the worker rather, is working on the floor, which can be hazardous to the part of the worker because workers may get back pain. Now, in order to improve this, we need to ensure that workers are working at the right height, okay? Another example of workplace ergonomics is the tools and materials used by the operators in carrying out their tasks. As you can see on the picture or in the example given, in the first image, the operator is using a wooden step stool, which is actually prone to accident because if in case there's a broken part of the step stool without the knowledge of the operator, then it can cause either injury or death of the employee. And so therefore, this is a violation to ergonomics. So we should use an ANSI or American National Standards Institute approved step stool, which you can see at the right portion or in the second image. Okay, so these are a brief overview of ergonomics, and these are just some of the many examples of ergonomics at home and at work. And so for this matter, in order to remove risk factors, which will lead to MSDs or injuries, and allow for improved human or operator performance and productivity, we should implement a home ergonomics or workplace ergonomics improvement process. 
Now, by making improvements to the work process, we are actually removing barriers to maximum safe work performance. We are also providing our workers with a job that is within their body's capabilities and limitations. Now, if this ergonomics improvement process is done well, then it can be a key contributor to our company's competitiveness in the marketplace and provide a better work experience for the people. And next, if we say the profession that applies theory, principles, data, and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and overall systems performance, it means that ergonomics draws on many disciplines to optimize the interaction between the work environment and the worker. These disciplines are the following. So we have anthropometry, biomechanics, industrial engineering, industrial design, information design, kinesiology, physiology, and lastly, we have psychology. So we will discuss the first discipline associated with ergonomics, and that would be anthropometry. Now, when we see anthropometry, it refers to the physical measurement of the human body. Now, according to Ciro Romelio Rodriguez um, Añez of 2001, since ergonomics is the science of work, of the people who do it, and the way it is done, the tools and equipment they use, the places they work in, and the physiological aspects of the working environment, therefore, anthropometry helps design to fit body sizes of the users, appropriate working levels, adequate workspace, and it also helps avoid overcrowding of machines and workers. Now, the second discipline that is associated with ergonomics, that would be biomechanics. Now, according to Hack and Cooper 2015, in their journal entitled, Ergonomics, Biomechanics, and MSDs, a review, biomechanics is the study of the structural elements of the human body in relation to how the body functions and how much stress, acceleration, and impact it can stand. Now, presently, the total energy demanded from a person in the performance of an industrial task has often been drastically reduced through better engineering and technology. What I mean about this is that most companies nowadays are already employing automation in their production processes. Despite this, stress may be created in small components of the worker's anatomy. Ergonomists use information about the functional anatomy of the living body to eliminate reduce or manage such stresses. And so for this matter, biomechanics is important in ergonomics because it looks into appropriate work postures, such as sitting and standing. It also looks into safe load lifting and carrying techniques. And lastly, it also looks into adapting proper techniques in manual material handling process. Now, aside from biomechanics, we also have industrial engineering. Now, another discipline where ergonomics is very useful is industrial engineering. Now, we know for a fact that all engineers work in planning, designing, implementing and controlling the systems that enable people to use technology, right? However, industrial engineers in turn design systems. And when I say we design systems, it means that industrial engineers help in the design of machines, the design of production processes, and design of management systems 
and the design of workstations or production layout. In fact, the industrial engineer has a dual role. First, to extend the human capability to operate, manage, and control the overall production systems. And the second is to ensure the safety and well-being of those working in the system. And that is why we help companies in the elimination of risk factors associated in the environment or working environment. And aside from the other disciplines mentioned, we also have industrial design. Now, according to Industrial Designers Society of America, industrial design or ID is the professional service of creating and developing concepts and specifications that optimize the function, value, and appearance of products and systems for the mutual benefit of both user and manufacturer. Having said that, industrial design looks into the aesthetics of the mass-produced product. It also looks into the usability of the product in a way that provides ease and convenience to the users. And since industrial design is concerned with the human aspects of machine-made products and their relationship to people and the environment, that is where ergonomics comes up. Industrial design looks at human behavior, meaning how the workers behave in terms of the tools and materials that they use in carrying out their tasks. Aside from that, it also looks into man-machine interface or how comfortable the operators are with the machines and equipment that they are using. If the height of the machine is too low or too high or just proportionate to the height of the operators. And lastly, it, also, it is also concerned with the general working environment of the operator. And another discipline that applies ergonomic principles is the information design. Businesses nowadays are concerned about the message, right? Car dealers like Suzuki and Toyota are actually trying to convince us to come down and look. Area health clubs like Anytime Fitness and Gold's Gym are also trying to convince us to experience their facilities. And the retailers like SM Mall and Pure Gold are trying to convince us to buy their wares. In a fast-paced world such as ours, there are only a few precious seconds to get the message across. So how do we do it? How do we quickly convince us to do whatever it is that they want? There is no simple answer, actually, as we each are driven by different things, but there are some common elements to be considered. Information design is the area that deals with these things and human factors the specific topic. So what are human factors then? When we say human factors, these are the ways in which we interact with the objects or people. In other words, our senses, the sight, the hearing, touch, smell, and taste. Therefore, ergonomics is applicable in information design because information design is the process of presenting information in a manner such that it can be understood immediately. And often, because of our dependence on eyesight, this is visual, but it isn't necessary. Radio commercials, as an example, don't have a visual component. You hear a voice or voices along with background sounds that give the impression of a specific setting. Similarly, Taste tests usually don't involve a visual component. Some even use blindfolds to remove any visual bias. In each of these cases, information design promotes the message in the form that most efficiently gets the meaning across. 
Okay, next we have kinesiology. Kinesiology involves the study of muscle movement and physical activity. When we say kinesiology and ergonomics, kinesiology and ergonomics come together in the design process as ergonomics is concerned with the human body's performance as it relates to the physical environment. When applied in the workplace, the goal of kinesiology is to prevent workplace injury and improve human-machine interaction. In fact, an employer may employ a kinesiologist to assist in workplace wellness as part of a comprehensive workplace wellness program. A kinesiologist may be responsible for creating a wellness space within the workplace, leading stretch and exercise programs, and providing on-site rehabilitative services. Another discipline that has ergonomics application is work physiology. Human factors and ergonomics is the application of physiological and physiological principles to the engineering and design of products processes and systems and so for this matter physiology helps control excessive physical loads it also helps avoid physical and muscular fatigue it helps adequate rest pauses and it also helps arrangement of static and dynamic work and lastly we have psychology as we all know psychology is the science of mind and behavior and therefore it helps avoid perceptual and mental load fatigue especially on the side of our operators or employees aside from that appropriate design of displays and control appropriate conditions for vigilance tasks avoid human error and stress, and also it helps job motivation and satisfaction. And so these are the disciplines that are applicable in ergonomics, okay? Or have direct relationship to ergonomics, okay? So what is meant by ergonomics? Ergonomics is also synonymous with human factors engineering. Now, as you can see on the tabulation, we have human factors and engineering. As you can notice, we have a listing of different topics that are covered under human factors and in engineering. Now, the main goal, take note, the main goal of human factors is to reduce costs, improve productivity, improve quality, improve employee engagement, and create a better safety culture. Now, some of the listings under human factors, we have physical and mental work capacity, fatigue, body forces, strength and posture, body sizes, thermal comfort, heat or stress or cold stress, vision, and so on and so forth, okay? These are examples of human factors. And on the engineering side, examples would be industrial design, workplace design, product design, furniture design, machine design, ventilation, lighting, acoustics, and so on and so forth, okay? So next, a key area that I'm gonna be discussing or highlighting to you today, that would be the history of ergonomics. Now, as you can see on the presentation, in ancient societies, some have stated that human ergonomics began with the Australopithecus Prometheus, or also known as the little foot, a primate who created handheld tools out of different types of stones, clearly distinguishing between tools based on their ability to perform designated tasks. Now, the foundations of the science of ergonomics appear to have been laid within the context of the culture of ancient Greece. 
a good deal of evidence indicates that Greek civilization in the 5th century BC used ergonomics principles in the design of their tools, jobs, and workplaces. And one outstanding example of this can be found in the description Hippocrates gave of how a surgeon's workplace should be designed and how the tools he uses should be arranged. In industrial societies, Bernardino Ramazzini was one of the first people to systematically study the illness that resulted from work, earning himself the nickname as the father of occupational medicine. Now, in the late 1600s and early 1700s, Ramazzini visited many work sites where he documented the movement of laborers and spoke to them about their ailments. Now, in 1857, Woodshig Jatrzybowski, a Polish scientist, inventor, naturalist, and professor, was the one who coined the word ergonomics. It was first used in the magazine Nature and Industry in his article, Ergonomics in Sketch or Theory of Work Based on Laws Derived from Nature. And in the 19th century, Frederick W. Taylor pioneered the scientific management, a method which proposed a way to find the optimum method of carrying out a given task. Now, Taylor found that he could, for example, triple the amount of coal that workers were shoveling by incrementally reducing the size and weight of coal shovels until the fastest shoveling rate was reached. Frank and Lillian Gilbreth expanded then Taylor's methods in the early 1900s to develop time and motion study. They aimed to improve efficiency by eliminating unnecessary steps and actions. However, this approach was rejected by Russian researchers who focused on the well-being of the worker. At the first conference on scientific organization of labor, Bekhterev and Mayasishev criticized Taylorism. Bekhterev argued that the ultimate ideal of the labor problem is not in Taylorism, but is in such organization of labor process that would yield a maximum of efficiency coupled with a minimum of health hazards, absence of fatigue, and a guarantee of the sound health and all-around personal development of the working people. Now, World War II marked the development of new complex machines and weaponry, and this made new demands on operators' cognition. It was no longer possible to adapt the tailoristic principle of matching individuals to pre-existing jobs. Now, the design of equipment had to take into account human limitations and take advantage of human capabilities. All right, so this is just a brief history of ergonomics, how it started, and who the proponents are as well. Okay, moving on to our next key area, that would be ergonomics domains of specialization. Now, the ergonomics is composed of three domains. First is the physical ergonomics. Second is the cognitive ergonomics. Third is the organizational ergonomics. So first, let us discuss what physical ergonomics is. If we say physical ergonomics, it is concerned with the human anatomical, anthropometric, physiological, and biomechanical characteristics as they relate to physical activity.
Now, when we say physical ergonomics, this is the ergonomics domain we are most concerned with in the workplace. And most of the content on this side is very much focused on workplace ergonomics. And workplace ergonomics is about fitting workplace conditions and job demands to the capabilities of working population. When jobs are designed to match the capabilities of people, it results in better work being produced and a better experience for the person doing it. Now, the benefits of workplace ergonomics, that would be a cost reduction, productivity improvement, quality improvement, employee engagement improvement, and we also have the creation of a better safety culture, okay? Why is it that reduces cost is considered to be as one of the benefits of workplace ergonomics? Now, one of the benefits of workplace ergonomics is the cost reduction. Now, the question is, how can we reduce the cost then? Well, we can reduce the cost by systematically reducing ergonomic risk factors. If we do this, then we can prevent the costly musculoskeletal disorders with approximately $1 out of every $3 in workers' compensation costs attributed to musculoskeletal disorders. This represents an opportunity for significant cost savings. Also, one of the benefits of workplace ergonomics is improves productivity. It will improve productivity by designing a job to allow for good posture, less exertion, fewer motions, and better heights and reaches. The workstation becomes more efficient. And next, we have improves quality. Remember, the poor ergonomics leads to frustrated and fatigued workers that don't do their best work, right? When the job task is too physically taxing on the worker, they may not perform their job like they were trained. For, for example, an employee might not fasten a screw tight enough due to a high force requirement, which could create a product quality issue, okay? So the next benefit that would be improves employee engagement. Note, employees notice when the company is putting forth their best efforts to ensure their health and safety. If an employee does not experience fatigue and discomfort during their workday, it can reduce turnover, it can decrease absenteeism, and it can improve morale and increase employee involvement as well. Now, the last benefit of workplace ergonomics that would be creates a better safety culture. Ergonomics shows your company's commitment to safety and health as a core value. The cumulative effect of the previous four benefits of ergonomics is a stronger safety culture for your company. Remember, healthy employees are your most valuable asset. Creating and fostering the safety and health culture at your company will lead to a better human performance for your organization, okay? So these are the benefits of workplace ergonomics. And we also have workplace ergonomics process. How do we go about with workplace ergonomics process? Now, a proactive ergonomics process identifies ergonomics risk factors and then reduces them through engineering and administrative controls before an injury occurs. Now, conducting an ergonomics risk assessment in response to an injury isn't a bad thing to do. In fact, it's what you should do. But there's a reactive approach 
And if you keep doing what you're doing, then you're going to keep getting out in front of the problem by being proactive. Remember that above all else, a world-class ergonomics program is proactive and viewed as a strategic continuous improvement process that makes a positive impact on the entire business. In other words, ergonomics shouldn't be an afterthought. If your ergonomics program is in reactive mode, it will only have a marginal impact on your facility at best. Now here is a deeper dive into the ergonomics improvement process we usually implement. Okay, step number one, prioritize jobs for ergonomic analysis. What do we mean by this? This prioritized list should be developed by the ergonomics team based on an initial facility tour, review of musculoskeletal disorder history, and data collected by employee service. Okay, that's step number one. Step number two in workplace ergonomics process, that would be to conduct ergonomic analysis. Risk. This analysis will objectively measure risk for each job in the workplace and help you develop an ergonomics opportunity list. And step number three, after, after conducting the ergonomics analysis, step number three would be developing an ergonomic opportunity list. Now, developing an ergonomics opportunity list allows you to prioritize company resources in order to effectively and efficiently reduce risk by putting the appropriate controls in place. And after developing an ergonomics opportunity list, we are now able to determine best solution with team approach. Here, a multidisciplinary team should be involved in determining the best controls for implementation. And step number five, we need to obtain final approval and implement solution. If the improvement requires a significant capital expenditures, costs justify the solution to gain approval, okay? And lastly, we need to evaluate the ergonomic improvement for effectiveness. Once improvements are in place, close the loop on the project by evaluating the ergonomics improvement and measuring its effectiveness. Okay, so this is how we go about with workplace ergonomics process. So next, we will discuss the workplace ergonomics risk factors. Take note that when we see risk factors, these are related to work activity and ergonomics can make it more difficult to maintain the balance between musculoskeletal fatigue and recovery and increase the probability that some individuals may develop an MSD. Now, the primary workplace risk factors to consider are high task repetition, forceful exertions, and we also have repetitive or sustained awkward postures. Okay, when we say high task repetition, many work tasks and cycles are repetitive in nature, right? And are frequently controlled by hourly or daily production targets and work processes. High task repetition when combined with other risk factors, such as high force and awkward postures, can contribute to the formation of musculoskeletal disorder. A job is considered as highly repetitive if the cycle time is 30 seconds or less. On the other hand, we have forceful exertions. Now, many work tasks require high force loads on the human body, and we cannot deny the fact. Muscle effort increases in response to high force requirements, which is true. 
increasing associated fatigue, which can lead to musculoskeletal disorder as well. And lastly, uh, the last ergonomic risk factors that would be repetitive or sustained awkward postures. Now, awkward postures place excessive force on joints and overload the muscles and tendons around the affected joint. Joints of the body are most efficient when they operate closest to the mid-range motion of the joint. Now, risk of musculoskeletal disorder is increased when joints are worked outside of this mid-range repetitively or for sustained periods of time without adequate recovery time. Okay, so these are our workplace ergonomics risk factors that we need to avoid. Again, the risk factors would be high task repetition, first fall exertions, and sustained awkward postures. Okay, next, we will be discussing ergonomic risk assessment tools. So what are then the tools that ergonomists usually use if they conduct ergonomics assessment or risk assessment? Okay, one of the tools used by the ergonomists if they assess a risk is what we call wishal lifting calculator. Now applying a scientific evidence-based approach to your ergonomics process is very important. The goal is to identify ergonomics risk factors, quantify them, and then make measurable improvements to the workplace, ensuring that jobs and tasks are within workers' capabilities and limitations. Now, the best approach for doing that is to make ergonomics an ongoing process of risk identification and risk reduction based on objective scientific analysis of your workplace. And when we say we shall lifting calculator, this is developed by the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries and based on NIOSH research related to the primary causes of back injuries. This lifting calculator can be used to perform ergonomics risk assessment on a wide variety of manual lifting and lowering tasks and can also be used as a screening tool to identify lifting tasks which should be analyzed further using the more comprehensive NIOSH lifting equation which is now our second risk assessment tool. Now, the NIOSH lifting equation is a tool used by occupational health and safety professionals to assess the manual material handling risks associated with lifting and lowering tasks in the workplace. This equation considers job task variables to determine safe lifting practices and guidelines. Now, the primary product of the NIOSH lifting equation is the recommended weight limit, or RWL, which defines the maximum acceptable weight or load that nearly all healthy employees could lift over the course of an eight-hour shift without increasing the risk of musculoskeletal disorder to the lower back. And in addition, the lifting index is calculated to provide a relative estimate of the level of physical stress and MSD risk associated with the manual lifting tasks evaluated, okay? The next risk assessment tools that are usually used by the ergonomists, that would be REVA, which means Rapid Entire Body Assessment. Now, this tool uses a systematic process to evaluate whole body pastoral MSD and ergonomics design risks associated with job tasks. Now, in REVA, Take note that a single page form is usually used to evaluate required body posture, first fall exertions, 
type of movement or action, repetition, and coupling. Next, a score is then assigned for each of the following body regions. We have the wrists, the forearms, the elbows, the shoulders, the neck, the trunk, the back, the legs, and the knees. And after the data for each region is collected and scored, tables on the form are then used to compile the risk factors variables, generating a single score that represents that level of MSD risk. So aside from REBA, we also have what we call RULA, or which means Rapid Upper Limb Assessment. Now, when we say RULA, it is a diagnostic tool that assesses biomechanical and postural load requirements of job tasks or demands on the neck, trunk, and the upper extremities. In RULA, a single page form is also used to evaluate required body posture, force, and repetition. Now, based on the evaluations, Scores are then entered for each body region in section A for the arm and wrist, okay, and section B for the neck and the trunk. After the data for each region is collected and scored, tables on the forms are then used to compile the risk factor variables, generating a single score that represents the level of MSD risk, okay? So the next uh, risk assessment tools that ergonomists usually use, that would be Liberty Mutual Manual Material Handling Tables, or also known as the SNOP Tables. Now this table outlines design goals for various lifting, lowering, pushing, pulling, and carrying out tasks based on research done by Dr. Stover Snook and Dr. Vincent Suriello at the Liberty Mutual Research Institute for Safety. Now the table provides weight or force values for specific types of tasks that are deemed to be acceptable to a defined percentage of the population. And this is done by comparing data for each of the specific manual material handling tasks against the appropriate table. And finally, the last risk assessment tools used, that would be the Washington State Ergonomic and MSD Risk Assessment Checklist. Now this tool is designed to actually evaluate ergonomics risk factors including awkward postures, highly repetitive motions, high hand force, repeated impacts, lifting, and hand arm vibration. Okay, so these are the ergonomic risk assessment tools that are normally used by the ergonomists every time they assess a risk in the production area or in any area of the company where there are ergonomic problems evident, okay? So next, a uh, domain of ergonomics, those are all the physical domains of ergonomics. And right now, we will discuss the other domain of ergonomics, which is the cognitive ergonomics. When we say cognitive ergonomics, this is concerned with mental processes such as perception, memory, reasoning, and modern response as they affect the interactions among humans and other elements of a system. Now, the relevant topics under cognitive ergonomics that would be mental workload, decision-making, skilled performance, human computer interaction, human reliability, work stress, and finally we have training as they may relate to systems design. And the last domain of ergonomics, that would be the organizational ergonomics. When we say organizational ergonomics, 
It is concerned with the optimization of social technical systems, including their organizational structures, policies, and processes, and relevant topics under organizational ergonomics that would be communication, crew resource management, work design, design of working times, teamwork, participatory design, community ergonomics, cooperative work, new work paradigms, virtual organizations, telework, quality management as well. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. So if you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button for the latest updates. Thank you.